Bueno, llegamos a la última conferencia magistral de esta Campus Party que a mí me ha emocionado muchísimo. Quiero agradeceros mucho a todos el que hayáis estado aquí la semana con nosotros. Queríamos guardar uno de nuestros mejores ponentes para el último momento. Yo empecé hace muchos años haciendo páginas web y, y encontré un servidor en Estados Unidos muy barato, muy bueno, con muy buena relación calidad-precio. Y a día de hoy son el mayor registrador de dominios del mundo. Son la empresa número uno del mundo en hosting y en, en registro de dominios. Quiero que disfrutemos todos hoy de la presencia del CEO de GoDaddy, Blake Irving. ¡Un aplauso! Gracias. ¿Qué pasó? No, mi español es muy malo, so uh, I'm going to do this in English. Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, this is going to be a little unusual for a presentation, and just for the record, uh, I was a college professor for a couple of years, so I'm going to talk about stuff that I know you like and things that I like, uh, and kind of get you thinking a little bit differently, talk about uh, even career trajectory and entrepreneurialism, and what uh, should get you fired up or what I hope gets you fired up. I'm talking about mashups, and mashing up, uh, mashing up is a pretty interesting uh, concept. It's taking concepts that exist today, applying other concepts, smashing them together, and see what you get. There's lots of wonderful examples around the world. Uh, in fact, if I took the first mashup, uh, and I guess I'd call it more of a career arc than a mashup, I'd use uh, this little boy. So this little boy is my father. And this photograph is from 1935. And my dad was a very unusual guy. He decided that uh, he was going to have one of those weird careers. So as a five-year-old kid, he was a uh, movie star in Hollywood doing children's films that were pretty, uh, pretty engaging. From that position, he decided he was going to be a musician and became a jazz musician and a hell of a good saxophone player. From that, he decided he was going to be an attorney. So he went to law school. When he left law school, he passed the bar and decided he didn't want to be an attorney. He wanted to work for the FBI. So he started working for the FBI. And then when he left the FBI, he decided he wanted to be an attorney. And so he became an attorney. And then when he was done doing that, he decided he wanted to be a jazz musician again. And the only thing he couldn't do again, he couldn't be a child actor. So he had this very interesting career arc that I was inspired by. And I decided that, you know, you really don't have to decide what you do early in life. And one of the things that I tell students and I tell folks that are earlier in their careers, um, don't think you have it right and that you have a straight line into whatever it is you want to do. Because it's never the case. There's always going to be something that surprises you and you want to keep yourself open to it. Uh, I'm a reasonable example of a mashup. Now, I'll talk about my career separately, but if you think about music as an example of great mashups, like, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a very eclectic guy. I love Tiesto. Uh, I love Head P.E. I love Ornette Coleman. I love a lot of different kinds of music. And if you think about where music has gone today, whether it's rock and roll, whether it's hip hop, whether it's house, it's all mashed up from 200 years of music, and now it's got very little to do in many cases with music, and it's about a mashup between musical styles and technology. And technology has become more and more influential in what we do. Now, the reason I'm not, I'm not going to go through musical history, but I started my career as a musician, much like my father did, 
and just fell in love with jazz and became a jazz, uh, jazz drummer. Now, I had this moment where I decided that wasn't going to be a very good career for me, having figured out that it's uh, not a great way to make a living. Uh, but it was super fun. I still do it. I'm one of the, probably the few CEOs you'll find that has a, a, a drum kit in his office. But what I did, I took the passion that I had for music, and I had that same kind of weird career arc that my dad did. I was a pretty reasonable artist. I started doing art, and I started designing typefaces. I went to school and started studying how to design typefaces. And this is a long time ago. This is back in the 70s. And uh, in 1980, uh, I had a portfolio review by a company called Xerox. And Xerox came into the, uh, the, the room that was my classroom and went through portfolio reviews and asked me if I'd like to go talk with their engineers and some other guys and see what they were doing. So what you see here behind me is a workstation that I used in 1980 that Xerox mashed up between a bunch of different kinds of technology. Does anybody recognize this thing? No. So this at its time in 1980 and 81 it was the most powerful computer you could imagine. Unbelievable. These little disks over here on your right, remember this is 1980. These are 10 and 20, back in the day, 10 and 20 megabyte removable hard drives. This processor, this big box down here had a 512, 512K of memory, which in 80 was amazing. It ran an operating system that was developed by Xerox. And that screen over there that you see had a full WYSIWYG interface with beautiful type. I had a laser printer that could print 30 pages per minute, 100 feet away from me on an internal ethernet. I was connected to the ARPANET, which was then the internet. Now imagine being a kid in college and you walk into an environment where somebody says, this is, this is for you. Can you just make some typography for us for this laser printer down here and make stuff look better on this thing? Because it looks really shitty right now. And we want it to look better. So that's honestly how I started my career in technology. It wasn't a straight line. It didn't make sense. It was a mashup between, oh my gosh, I can do what with software? And frankly, from this, from this job, I fell in love with software, I fell in love with hardware, and I started designing software, and then started designing hardware to go build it. And then from there, I ended up doing a number of other things, one of which was actually going to a company called Microsoft uh, in the early 90s, in 1992, and started mashing up some of the things that I had learned in those other previous careers with this weird thing that uh, was just starting to happen that I was on in 1980 called the Internet. So I had had 10 years, 12 years experience, and you know we had a company at Microsoft in the early 90s that was pretty obsessed with packaged software. Software is awesome. It comes in a box. It has disks. That's how you get it. You know, and I was thinking, well, why, why do you need to do that? You know, you have this delivery mechanism that's the internet, and that's where you ought to be doing stuff. And frankly, you ought to be communicating over these pipes that aren't very fat right now, but they will be. So why don't we start building protocols and architectures that allow those things to communicate back and forth? And while at that company, I did some things that were uh, interesting, something called NetMeeting, something called MSN Messenger, something called Hotmail, something called Passport, something called Windows Live, uh, which ended up being, uh, which is now Office 365 and they're back in. But it was all about trying to take the minds of folks and say, it's not about the package software you know. It's about all these other technologies that exist that you're not using to the fullest. And there's a bunch of different ways that we could, we could use these things. When I, left, uh, when I left Microsoft in 2007, we had uh, about a billion people using that software cloud that we had built. And this is 2007, that's a long time ago. It, uh, you know, Facebook was still an ED, you'd still needed an EDU address to use Facebook back in the day. So, 
So think about that as a career arc for me and a mashing up of all those software things that I talked about. And I want you to think about what's happening today. And as entrepreneurs, I want you to kind of get your head on, screw it on, maybe even backwards, and kind of take a sideways look at what's happening today so you can maybe make some innovative entrepreneurial decisions on what's happening. And I'll use a couple of examples uh, here for you. So these are mashups. So if you think about cloud technology today, lots of people talk about the cloud. Look, the cloud is over, so overhyped and nobody actually knows what it is. If you just think about it as being a large data repository with good compute power that allows you to do things that are highly personal and then attach just about anything to it that you want to do that's a practical application, you end up with pretty magic stuff. As an example, take cloud technology, take a corpus of music, take personalization and signal strength from individuals that are using it, attach a social network to it, and you have Spotify, which allows you to see what other people are playing, rip off, not rip off, that's not, that's not what I meant, uh, use other people's playlists, lease music, rent music. In fact, if you looked at the, looked at the state of the music industry today, streaming revenue increased 12.5%, and for the first year, last year, digital purchases of music went down 2.5%. So this capability, which five years ago, people thought was, it's just Pandora. I mean, really, how real can it get? It's now not just Pandora. It's, it's, a, it's a leasing service that, frankly, with broadband being as ubiquitous as it is, I use it in my car more than I'm using iTunes. I mean, it's, it's just that simple to use. That's cloud technology used in a very practical way that fuels passions around music. Here's another one. Think about broadband and how ubiquitous it's got in the home. Like, I think even in America, where we are, unfortunately, the 16th in a line of who are the most ubiquitous broadband countries in the world, we are number 16 out of the top 17 in the world. Yet we still have the ability to take that same personal cloud that I talked about, ubiquitous bandwidth into the home. So getting you know, 10 gigs into your home, not a big deal. Add client architecture that can actually buffer appropriately, better than a browser, and you've got streaming media. Streaming high quality media that can actually manage connection speed, manage connection length, and be able to make determinations on your behalf of based on what's happening in your own home network. And if somebody else is using a PC, it can downgrade the stream. That's another example of a mashup. Another one. So think about machine learning. Giant Hadoop database, a bunch of map produce jobs over the top of it, using machine learning to, to know as much about a subject as anything possible. Don't take Siri, just take natural language processing on top of that. Siri's a reasonable example. There's actually a bunch of, you know, that, that go back into the early 90s, late 80s. And if you think about what that's become today, there's a product that IBM creates today called Watson. Uh, I don't know how many of you watched a Jeopardy competition between the three top Jeopardy winners a couple years ago against Watson. Uh, Watson won. So by using machine learning, a large Hadoop database, giant cloud technology, natural language processing, you can create somebody that is going to be as powerful on the phone as an individual. So if you think about what's going to happen in call centers over the course of the next five to 10 years, call centers will be taking calls, knowing exactly what you're saying, giving you really good advice, and you never talk to anybody. You talk to that. Another example. So every, everybody, who has a, f a phone in their pocket? Smartphone? How many smartphones in here? Most of you? Okay, a lot of them. Does anybody have Waze, this app? Okay, pretty good number. There's 70 million Waze customers today. 70 million, which is one of the reasons why Waze was bought by Google. So I want you to think about 
predictive analytics, which again is a big data problem, and it's a series of algorithms that sit on top of it, and a bunch of signals that are coming in from 70 million different users that are in different neighborhoods. Let's use Los Angeles as a pretty big neighborhood. The congestion on freeways in Los Angeles is bad. Uh, the congestion in Guadalajara is not great. Congestion in Mexico City is really bad. So if you, think about, if you think about Waze for a minute, what Waze does is it takes signal strength from this device. It allows me to ping a server, tell you exactly where I am, tell you how fast I'm moving, tell you how close I am to other people that have this exact same device running that same application, and can tell you if there's a traffic jam there. Can tell you what best route to take to get around it. You don't have to know it. It just tells you which way to go. Now, for me, because I have a car problem, it does other things. Because not only does it take signal strength from a device like this, feed that into a big database, allow you to do some really interesting predictive analytics, it also takes social signal. So if uh, I'm in a car and I'm talking to Siri and I say, there's a, a police officer at the corner of this street and it actually will notify anybody else that's in that area that there happens to be a cop hiding out, ready to give tickets in a particular spot. That is a very valuable service. And that's a crazy mashup of big data, mobile everywhere, predictive analytics, and a very clever app with 70 million users and it's growing uh, by hundreds of thousands a week. Next. Okay. Does any, you guys, any Formula One fans in here? Anybody? All right. So Formula One has grown up a lot, right? Besides they changed their motors, their engines this year, uh, there was, and you know, nobody's happy about the sound those things make anymore. The, the, the most incredible thing that's happened to Formula One over the course of the last five years is the amount of data that they've been taking off the cars and the analytics they're getting from the cars. Every Formula One wrap, lap, every car feeds 25 megabytes of data to a central server that sits in the pit. I've, I've been in these pits. They, they look more like laboratories than they do like pits. And Formula One teams are now taking so much data that they are limited to 25 teraflops a week of data that they're allowed to send back and forth between their teams. That is no shit. 25 teraflops a week that they're using, and this is what's mind-blowing. They're getting that information. They're at a track. The conditions at the track are unusual. As the data comes in, they will model parts for the car and in the pit will make new parts. So this picture is uh, from the Austin race track last year. Uh, and I was in the Toro Rosso pits with the Toro Rosso team. I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to be taking pictures. Uh, tur turns out the team was pretty, pretty unhappy with me. But uh, it's hard to see. But if you look carefully, you'll see a couple of shapes in the bottom that have, uh, they look like they're clear. You see them? kind of down here in the yellow section. So they're clear because Toro Rosso doesn't want any of their teammates to know they have them. But they channel air over the car in a certain way depending on what track they're on. They will model those parts at the track and put them on based on the data that they're getting back from the car. Same thing's happening in the differential that you see over here. Besides it being the first carbon fiber differential most of you have ever seen in your life, uh, which is incredibly light and insanely durable, this, again, could be modeled at the track. It's unbelievable the amount of technology that's happening that's a mashup of racing, big data, machine learning, and 3D printing. And by the way, there's a pretty cool little 3D printer demo over here uh, if you haven't checked it out. Uh, not, not quite so sophisticated, but you can build a cool uh, rook um, for, for your chess game. All right, so that's Formula Run. Now, why do I share all this with you and you think, you know, well, you know, some of the stuff I know already, there's no aha moments in there. 
Because you guys, the students of today, the people that are in this room, the people that are in this giant room, are the guys that are going to do this in the future. You're the people that are going to make the changes happen. Right? And the way you do that is going to, be, is going to determine you know, the, future of, the future of Mexico, the future of Brazil, the future of the United States. It's how much fuel can you put in the entrepreneurial machine in Mexico and how much risk can you take and how much technology can you push and how much can you mash up. By the way, when you have services, and I'll talk a little bit about this, like Amazon Web Services, things like GoDaddy, other places that will power your back end, you'll be able to do a lot of that without actually making huge investment. Very important point. So, talk to a lot of people that are your age and that are technologists. They all want to do their own thing. They don't want to work for somebody. They want to go build their own product. They want to go take some risk and get out there and do it. The freedom that comes with that <coughs> is very alluring. But it's also scary as shit. It is very scary. And the folks that I've talked to that have been willing to take that bet have failed more than once, most of the time. <coughs> and if you think about entrepreneurs, the thing that defines them is what they do when they fail. Do they take that next step? Is failure okay? It is scary. <coughs> you know, it, and this is a, a quote that was from Lifehacker. It sounds terrific to get paid to do what you love. For most of it, though, it's unrealistic and may, maybe even preposterous. It's ridiculous. That was a giant bottle. Um, okay, crazy. So let's just analyze this for a minute. Just for a minute. This is sort of the way we think about our next job. With me, students? What pays the most and what am I good at? Somewhere in there, if I combine those two things and I look at that Venn diagram, in the middle of it is probably the sweet spot. What am I good at? What pays the most? You kind of want to be in the middle. You don't want to be over here on something that pays the most that you hate doing because that's no way to go through life. You want to do something that's great. Okay, so now let's make it a little more complicated. What pays the most? What you're good at? What you love to do? The intersection of those three things is even smaller. But that is where small business begins. That's where entrepreneurialism begins. People don't become entrepreneurs because they want to make a boatload of money. They become entrepreneurs because they think they know how to do something better than anybody else. And then they say, you know, and I'm good at it. And I bet if I'm good at it, and it's got commercial viability, people will pay me for it. So how about I do that? That's where small business begins. That's what you guys need to do if you're going to go take that leap. Find out that thing you're passionate about. What is it? Take a shot at it. If you fail, do it again. <coughs> so, here's some statistics for you. These are from the U.S. The big number's not. The big number's worldwide. Two hundred million, what I'll call very small businesses, worldwide. There's actually two hundred and ten million, very small businesses. This is not counting people that just have an idea. <coughs> In the United States, which is thirty million, seventy-five percent of the businesses in the United States, of all businesses in the United States, are sole proprietors, one person. 85% have less than five employees. 80% are older than three years old. So th it's working. I can pay my bills, or I can almost pay my bills. 80% are service-based, or they're not even product people, they're figuring out how to go service. A lot of guys that actually develop software for other people, develop websites, are in this category. 
most of these people don't want to be Mark Zuckerberg. They don't want to be Bill Gates. Most of them will say, I have pretty humble, I have pretty humble ambitions. I want to be able to do what I love. I want to be able to work 30 hours a week. I want to spend more time with my family. I want to do the things that I think give back to the community. Those are the kind of things that these people are doing. It's a big number. And it's you. So, now this is back to the point I was making. This is a, this is a hacking event. This is a coding event. Okay. It is so much easier to start your own thing today than it was five years ago or ten years ago. From a venture capital perspective, when, when I was acquiring companies ten years ago, or looking at companies that were in this business, they had taken on massive amounts of capital expense because they had to build out their own hardware. They had to build out their own data center. They don't have to do that anymore. Today, there's technology that exists. At, at things like uh, Amazon, at Rackspace, at GoDaddy, at Media Temple, at a whole bunch of companies worldwide that will provide services for you that you pay for as you go. If you're not successful, you know, get out, stop, and start it up again. Try again. But you don't actually have to do it all, all at once. And you don't have to spend a boatload of money to do it. That's a sea change from not long ago. It's a big, big difference. Things have gotten very, very easy as well. Being able to go deploy a set of servers with one button, being able to go deploy back office software with one button, and being able to use somebody else's compute power to go power whatever it is you want to do, you can do. Whether it's predictive analytics, predictive technology, that's actually going to scale with you. So for those of you who don't use some of the capabilities that an AWS or a Rackspace have today, you can actually by, v, by virtual machines, by VMs, as you go. So if you start consuming more and your site gets popular, you just start eating more of a cloud that somebody else owns automatically. And that exists today. So for the very small business guys that are out there, and most of the people that are starting their own thing aren't doing technology. They're not. Most of them are services. People might be baking cakes, they might op open a restaurant, they might do whatever. It's, in, in fact, most of the entrepreneurs that are out there are not technology guys at all. And all they want to do, please make it easy for me to get started, make it easy for my business to get found, make it easy for me to get connected to my customers, and help me get paid. So, a couple things we're doing at GoDaddy, and I'll just do a quick commercial <laughs> for... For, as long as I'm up here, I might as well, right? So we run a cloud service, and we have something that's very super simple, one click, and I'll give a couple of examples of this. The first thing is called Get Found. Uh, we acquired a company called Loku that was an MIT-based uh, startup. 24 MIT PhDs, super smart guys, and they had built a set of big data analytics that would look at the web go out and grab information on what, an, what a little business's presence was or a little service's presence was, get data, find out where the differences were, analyze them, allow you to change them, and then syndicate it out to every listing service that matters. So what you see here is a small owned restaurant in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's called Maley's Thai Bistro. If you have a, uh, an iPhone or an uh, Android, do a search query on Google for Thai food, Old Town Scottsdale, and this is the only thing that will come up. You'll swear it's the only restaurant there. Because the mashup of big data, predictive analytics, client, client software on a phone allows us to do an amazing job producing a result set that is insanely accurate and raises you up in Google, in Bing, in Yelp, in OpenTable, in Urban Spoon for this restaurant. Next, and this is a one click as well. Clicking one time, data in, and provisioning an office backend. 
we do this at GoDaddy today for little businesses. So if somebody wants to run office in their back office, they fill out this one page and they can configure the entire office suite for up to three, four, five people um, just with one, with one click of a button. Hit the little green button at the bottom and you've provisioned Blake at BlakeIrving.com or Mike at YourBusiness.com, whatever it is. One click. Incredibly simple. And finally, and this is something we're doing uh, here in, uh, in Mexico as well as about, uh, about 17 other countries today, something called Go Mobile. And Go Mobile is actually a mobile website creation tool. Uh, go into the, you can either go up on the Android store or you can go into the iTunes store and download this app for free. And it allows you to create a website park it on a, not get a domain, but actually create a really nice website and then buy a domain if you want and have a domain that this thing sits on and it's beautiful. And not only does it look good on a phone and allows you to get found, allows your customers to find you, it also does the same thing on a PC automatically and on a tablet. And again, super simple, kind of getting down to that one click, make it easy for me, value proposition. So... Imagine you're all small businesses, you've all taken the leap, you're off to the races. And you want to figure out what somebody else in the world is doing that has the exact same business that you have. So think out into the future. You guys all know what Facebook is. You all know what probably LinkedIn is. They allow you to connect with other people that are kind of like you, but not a lot, but they're your friends and you get to see a bunch of random stuff that they're doing. Um, well, what if you had the ability to connect with a network of many small businesses that were just like you? Many entrepreneurs that were going through the same struggles that you were going through and trying to figure out what the next thing to do was. If it's a software developer, somebody that could help you solve a problem, could tell you what they did. If it was somebody that was a restaurant owner and there was another place that was nearby or across the country or in another country and can help you solve that problem. That's the big data mart that we're building at GoDaddy today. And then others are building as well. And if you think about big data and having a, so a single data architecture underneath every service that you offer, that's, that's what you end up with. Facebook ended up being as powerful as because of a single data architecture where every user was connected to every other Every action, every verb, every image was connected to every other, all because it's a super flat infrastructure and architecture. So, the notion of what should I do next doesn't just apply to the small businesses, it applies to you guys. So you're in a pretty critical juncture. I know many of you are students, and you've got to make a decision what you do next. You're here, you're mashing up with a whole bunch of other people that are in the same kind of spirit and passion. They love technology, they love coding. What are you going to do with it? You've got some decisions to make. You're going to go work for a company, you're going to go work for a government, or you're going to go work for yourself. So I want you to think really hard over the course of the next couple of years you're in school. And then when you start your career and you're working for somebody else, I want you to start thinking if that's what you really want to do. Is it that Venn diagram that says, what am I good at, what makes the most, and what do I really love? And try to put yourself in the middle of that. Because there's a whole lot of companies, my company's one of them, there's quite a few of us, that are in the business of trying to help you do that. Take advantage of it. And don't be afraid to take that leap. Eleanor Roosevelt had a, a nice quote which is, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their, their dreams. For me, it's, I believe in the beauty of your dreams. And so, trying to power those things and trying to give you software that can make that possible is what my entire company is about. And that's what we're doing. That's what's happening in here. So help each other, think really hard, figure out what you're going to do over the course of your career, and have a great rest of show. Thanks.
Thank you.